So, um, so Allied Fund, um, right, let's start here. Okay. So, um, it's expected by the year 2050 that 10 million people a year will die of antibiotic resistant drugs. And this isn't just a problem in developing countries, but in fact, already just a few years ago, we saw an outbreak um, of such um, antibiotic resistant bacteria um, in the United States. You might be thinking that this would be a priority for pharmaceutical companies sort of investing into research into um, this and how we can stop this problem, but it isn't. And in fact, many of the major pharmaceutical players like Novartis, like AstraZeneca, are shutting down their antibiotic resistance research divisions for the simple reason that they're not profitable. The drugs that they are pouring their R&D money into are drugs like um, cardiac drugs, diabetes drugs, you know, the things that you have to chronically take for 10 years, 20 years, and you're still not going to get better from the disease, but you're going to make the pharmaceutical company a lot of money in the meantime. There we go. In other words, it's profit and not impact that, determined, that, that determines which products make it to market. And this isn't just a problem in the pharmaceuticals industry, um, which is the example I just highlighted, but also in um, high, high production and R&D cost, low production volume industries, such as renewable energy, such as space, space exploration. As a result of this, hundreds of desperately needed innovations each year do not make it to market uh, for the simple reason that they lack R&D funding to turn them into profitable products. Enter Allied Fund. Allied Fund is crowdfunding for governments where private companies can list their R&D pro projects and, it, and receive uh, collective investing from various governments in exchange for perks, such as initial access um, to the product once it hits the market, or discounts on initial orders, et cetera. So obviously in the process of trying to build a, a blockchain application, we need to evaluate why we're actually implementing this technology. And there's four main points that we've identified that really uh, hit home as to why we are implementing uh, a blockchain. So first off, there are multiple parties, none of which who really trust each other. There are multiple governments we envision being on this platform, each that may have their own laws. And then within each of those governments, there's gonna be multiple companies that operate within those borders. So there needs to be a common set of rules that everyone can play by. Next, uh, most of these organizations are not really near each other. In fact, there's a high probability that some of these payments are gonna be cross-border. So using the internet of value enables as fluid of payments as we can facilitate. Next, in the context of six plus figure deals potentially, um, and contractual perks, auditability is a key feature of legal disputes. We need to provide all the infrastructure to see what happened in the process of investing in something on this platform, and a blockchain makes that really easy for us. And finally, um, governments shouldn't really be able to control the escrow contracts of another government. So unless the company that is in a contract with this first government is in the second government's borders, then that second government should never have control. So we're decentralizing the contracts for these governments. And we rely on four different main features out of this technology. The first of which is trying to build legally binding IOUs. So we spoke to numerous blockchain industry experts in the Cincinnati area, local to us, mainly CPROP, which is a cryptocurrency property um, registry, I believe, uh, and then 10XTS, which is a more general emerging tech consultancy, but they do the majority of their work with blockchain. And based off of our conversations, we determined that IOUs would probably be best. So essentially what we're doing is signing these checks, locking them in the blockchain and then letting the blockchain make them accessible through another signature uh, in certain conditions, specifically when the fundraiser has raised all of the funds it needs to and the time uh, for the fundraiser has elapsed. Um, we are running on the Ethereum blockchain. So Ethereum is a spoon of Ethereum. Um, 
which uses the Avalanche consensus protocol, which is very fast and allows us to benefit from the development properties of Ethereum as stuff is released for the root network, it will pass down onto Ethereum. However, we won't need to deal with any of the network congestion that comes with using the most popular root chain. So on yeah, top of is that- Yeah, there um, a particular concern? Uh, well, I can get into this in more detail later, but um, with transaction times on these kinds of, like these aren't payments like day to day, right? So just- No, but- um, we do so that's that's part of it and the other important thing is that um there is a supportive founding team which we have some connections in our network with and they are offering financial incentives to build on that network um given that we're gonna talk uh kind of briefly about our app uh towards the bottom there's definitely uh, some incentive for us to try to get some early money to throw into developing the front end of our app. Yeah, sure. Um, so that's kind of a secondary uh, motivation for using Ethereum. Though we do think that the blockchain itself has the uh, correct requirements to sustain an application like this. Okay. Now, obviously, um, we're gonna be dealing with some pretty confidential information. Mm -hmm. So there's a very recent project that came out um, out of EY and Microsoft called Baseline Protocol. And essentially what they're trying to do is store hashes of data on chain and then reference that data off chain. Um, so you can have your internal systems doing all of this work and, and adding everything up, but because there's a private key in those internal systems, it makes the, the data on chain makes complete sense to you, but anyone else looking at the data from a public explorer just sees garbled nonsense. Right. So we will be employing that to make sure that we're not putting anything that could compromise either a company or a government's operations on chain. And then finally, the uh, possibly biggest offering is the programmable contrib or contribution reward system. Essentially, we will have preset offerings like get the first pick on the second batch of solar panels or get a 5% discount or a 10% discount. So there are different preset perks that can be set as well as different tiers at which they can be awarded. And then we will programmably generate the legal language that is put in the IOU. So, yeah. Awesome, yeah. Um, stepping away from the uh, from the pitch for a moment and into conversation territory here, um, let me just give a, a quick example of a scenario in which this might be used. Um, so, for example, let's say there's a solar panel company in Spain. Um, this this company is developing low light efficiency solar panels. They've got the blueprint ready, and they go to the Spanish government saying, "Here's my blueprint. Um, here's all my registration details. I would like you to fund this low light efficiency solar panel." You know, the government of Spain would probably uh, almost certainly not be interested in funding this project on the basis that Spain doesn't need low light efficiency solar panels. They've got plenty of time year round. Whereas the governments of Norway, Denmark, Sweden, they might may very well be interested in this project. And what Allied Fund essentially allows is for them to say fund a million dollars each or a million dollars and two million dollars and three million dollars respectively um, in order to pour into this project and then get access to it. Uh, along with its various perks. So that being said, um, our main competitors, there's sort of two main sources of funding for companies. And the first is the sort of the very traditional online um, crowdfunding platforms that we're all familiar with, Kickstarter, GoFundMe, etc. The primary problem, of course, with these is that they are very low scale sort of household budget scaled um, operations. So even if not in theory, in practice, the uh, maximum cap at which um, investments can be raised is two to three million dollars. Beyond this, there's also the issue of legal compliance. There aren't that many significantly enforced um, checks and balances to prevent, say, an American citizen from investing in a project being developed in Cuba or Iran. And then finally, there's of course a lack of traceability that is inherent in almost any non-blockchain system, um, where if somewhere along the line, 
um, the claim to perks gets lost, it's very hard to backtrack um, and actually stake that claim. And then the other main course of action is um, things like issuing stock, um, going to venture capitalists, and then also in a sort of side parentheses, issuing bonds. Um, the problem with the majority of these methods is that they dilute the company on the basis that they are not limited to individual projects like Allied Fund is. So Allied Fund um, raises money for an individual blueprint, issuing stock raises money for the entire company, and it, of course it then dilutes um, the company. There's also a lack of transparency, especially when it comes to bonds. Um, this is an insight that we uncovered through our conversation with 10XTS that Jack mentioned. Um, you know, between the investment banks, the brokers, the buyers and the sellers, there's a tremendous lack of transparency. Uh, and of course, this is um, prime territory for a blockchain solution. So in contrast to that, Allied Fund offers legal compliance through smart contracts, um, proof of investment um, through IOUs, um, a decreased bureaucracy due to you know simply the reduction in paperwork, but also and um, the sort of gathering of all intermediaries into you know, more or less one platform, and then it does this all while being um, the the world's first platform to facilitate collective government to private investments in such a uh, such a fintechy manner, so to speak. Talking about our market size, you know we're looking at a massive 1.7 trillion US dollars of global R and D spending. But more important than that is that 80% of this spending is in the hands of 10 countries. So what that means is that the remaining approximately 170 countries are in a dire need to pool their resources together, to pool their R&D budgets together if they want to compete with these investment powerhouses, the R&D powerhouses um, of the world. But as part of the UN's sustained development goals, um, countries member to the UN have pledged to substantially increase public and private R&D spending by the year 2030. So we really only can project this market size to continue growing, especially as pandemics like the, the COVID-19 pandemic, et cetera, um, increase or at least stay stable as they are now. Um, next up, let's look at uh, how this problem projects in various localities around the world. Um, here in the United States, federal R&D spending is at its lowest levels since World War II. Um, and it's half of what it was in the mid 1980s. So we do see sort of a steady decline um, in that. And there have been um, multiple um, sort of experts have come out and said, well, we're gonna need a drastically different approach to solving problems um, through R&D if the government isn't willing to fund what it was two decades ago. Um, so public-private partnerships um, have been on the rise. Universities have been trying to figure out alternative methods of funding. And also on a governmental level, the incentive system is beginning to be altered such that, for example, if a company brings a drug to a market and it's successful, they will then retroactively receive the, uh, the funds that the government may provide them through their budget. The World Bank is saying that there's um, an increasing government awareness to attract foreign direct investment into their countries, which translates into the real world as a sort of um, a window shopping, a desire for a window shopping experience where their um, local uh, companies within the government will be advertised by the government to foreign governments. Um, so, for example, if you look at the Turkish government, they have a, um, a official web platform where anybody from around the world can log on and see the various public or private uh, projects being developed and they can bid on them um, through that process or they can simply um, stake a claim to it through contact with the um, official responsible, etc. Also, the European Commission um, is now on a steady rise when it comes to fintechs, and they're specifically looking to support fintechs that facilitate um, capital flows within its member countries. Um, this is tightly integrated with, but also separate from its Horizon 2020 program, uh, which is sort of their equivalent of the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and so we think there's a great opportunity to sort of capitalize on that by obtaining official support for adoption practices within the European Union. So there's really two sides to the adoption and marketing equation. On one hand, we've got governments that we want to onboard in the system. And on the other hand, we've got companies. Looking first at the governments, we want to target blockchain forward countries in the European Union, primarily because the you know, majority um, homogenous legal infrastructure allows for easier cross-border transactions because it's a unified capitals market. Um, but also, like I said, there's the official support for such fintechs and the specific countries that we want to look at um, already have good blockchain regulations in place. 
Um, they have relatively low R&D budgets, which means that they would be willing and looking to pool their resources with other countries. And they have relatively neutral diplomatic relations, making it easier um, to, um, to facilitate such cross-border transactions without getting hung up on, say, tariffs or sanctions. Examples of such countries um, include, but are not limited to, of course, um, Estonia, France, Denmark, Malta, uh, and Cyprus. Specifically, uh, to reach governments, uh, we've been doing a lot of talking with people um, who have either worked with or are in governments, um, such as um, official an official within the Pakistani um, government, fairly high ranking, um, people who have done work with the Philippines government, with the World Bank as uh, on a consultancy basis, etc. And what we've identified at is that there's an opportunity to use blockchain institutes and economic development agencies to sort of take a bottom-up approach to reaching um, the necessary decision makers within the government. Further, we think um, the UNIFC um, and regional cooperation committees, um, we, can, we can capitalize on them for them to sort of advocate for our adoption because they have also have a stake um, in increasing these capital flows for into research and development as we talked about. Also local partnerships, like I said, um, we had some conversations with um, a company that does work with the Philippines government and they were actually the ones who identified an opportunity. I said, well, why don't you come and deploy this in the Philippines using our contacts? Um, and so we think local partnerships might be very beneficial, especially as we look to go beyond the European Union, which is our initial target market. On the company level, uh, companies that will be listing their projects um, for R&D, we want to target companies, of course, in countries without significant trade barriers for the same reasons I mentioned these governments for. Um, but specifically, we're looking at industries with high costs and low trade volumes, um, such as the pharmaceutical industry, the renewable energy and the space technology industry, um, because these are, uh, are companies that can't really turn a profit unless they are receiving some sort of external funding to increase their feasibility. We also want to focus on influential ambassadors. I mean, we all know that Walmart has become sort of a, almost an invaluable asset, a case study um, to IBM and its Hyperledger platform um, as a demonstration of the value they can provide. So these are the sort of token companies that we want to focus on. You know, looking into our very basic finances, we've got three main revenue streams. Um, the first being listing fees that occur when companies want to list a project on the platform. Um, the second being transaction fees that occur when an investment is made. And the third are membership fees for governments. So the, the final one sort of turns it into a quasi software as a service platform. And the reason we're pursuing that, um, that integration is because we want governments to have a stake in this. We, we don't want it to be a install and forget platform. And we think having it um, positioned as a sort of recurring software as a service um, subscription um, while unconventional will allow for greater integration into their systems. Uh, all of these uh, costs are established on a percentage bracket basis. So for example, when we look at membership fees for governments, we realize that it's not fair to charge, say the, or it's, it's not equally feasible to charge the United States government and the government of say Eritrea the same amount. Uh, it's in, infeasible for us and they're reaping different amounts of benefits. So we want to take it as um, potentially a percentage of GDP. Um, in costs, we sort of break these down a bit further on, but um, you know the, the four classic ones, development um, of the product, support um, to the clients, marketing and operation costs. Um, with all these included, um, we estimate that we'll be turning approximately a three and a half million dollar profit by the end of year four. Of course, as you're familiar, you know these are just projections um, and we'll see how it actually turns out. But we think this is a reasonable um, estimate based on fairly unbiased sources. Okay, so this is sort of our focus on the technical side in the immediate future. There are about a billion things that probably need to be done for this in the process of turning it into a fully fledged service that can stand up to something like Facebook or Google with respect to fault tolerance and, and uh, reliability. But for now, what we need to focus on is building a minimum marketable product. So we're not even focused on the minimum viable product yet. What we want to do is we want to freelance out some of the JavaScript oriented technologies uh, because currently I'm the only one building it. 
there are two different technologies, basically, uh, the, or two different aspects, the front end and the back end. And it seems to us that the best use of our funds and time is to have myself focus on the decentralized aspects of it, building the Ethereum code. Um, so as I have listed, build the smart contracts, deploy to Ethereum, and then hashing away the data with baseline protocol. Those are things that I would focus on um, in the event that we raise our funds. And then we need to orchestrate a React.js application using Redux to basically show different views to different users at the same URLs. And then obviously we need to serve that from somewhere. So we will most likely use AWS for all of our services. Nice. So, and then, yeah, just scroll down real quick. And then this is an actual map of um, the components we think need to be built for this front end um, in the process of actually trying to freelance it out. There are obviously ways to break up each of these smaller pieces more, and there are some features that aren't included. For instance, uh, in Project Browser, uh, which is close to the middle, it just says search filter. Um, and there are a bunch of different parts to a search filter, obviously. So it is a little bit high level. Um, we do skip over some stuff, but for a general idea of every single part that needs to be in the basic app, this is what we came up with. So I'm not gonna go over all of it, just because there is a lot. Um, and you know, you're welcome to look at it in your own time. Um, so I'm just going to go over well, one of the basic ones. Um, or one of, so the fundraiser project, um, you know, we're going to have a bunch of different projects. So we would want anyone who's browsing to be able to go not only through a lister, but to potentially, or a listing like feed, but to potentially link a specific project to someone else so that they can go look at it. So we need to have the route slash project, like alliedfund.com slash project slash 01462. That's the ID of a German company selling um, a coronavirus vaccine, maybe. That would have a description. It would have attached files, which are potentially any sort of patents or any other information they want to share with investors. It's a repository where they can put anything they think will convince funders to fund them. Um, funding statistics such as um, how much needs to be raised, how much has already been raised, contact information so that potential funders can audit the actual team of this listing and then a module displaying the perks. And then on top of that, there are going to be multiple views that are accessing this. You can access the project's listing as a company or you can access it as a government so if you're accessing it as a company you're most likely the company that listed that project so you want to be able to see all the other investors um, and get a more personalized view on the analytics of who's going in and touching this project and as a government you are going to want the ability to potentially invest so there needs to be an investment module in that so there are a ton of uh, other examples like this throughout the map, but um, this is generally what we're looking to freelance out. And that concludes our slides. Um, hopefully we've addressed a decent amount of your questions, but at this point, you know, whatever questions you have, please feel free to shoot up with them. Yeah, no, absolutely. That was awesome. Thanks guys. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess one of the first things we usually ask is like what your experience is as a founder or your technical expertise. So um, if you want to go a little into a little more about your background. Yeah, so um, I guess I'll start. I, um, I'm, studying, I'm studying marketing at Miami University um, with a business analytics minor and entrepreneurship minor. Um, but of course, you know, academic experience is very limited, isn't it? It's, uh, it's not quite the real world. Um, but on the side, sort of probably my most significant experience at the moment is I am the vice president for a Turkish blockchain consultancy called Depons. Um, you know, I call it a consultancy. It's more of an institute because we um, operate in both for-profit and non-profit um, areas. We've, we're doing some pretty significant work with some pretty significant clients. 
Um, I can't obviously name names, but um, it includes um, things like um, academic teams, banks, um, crypto exchanges with you know, multi-million dollar um, a month transaction volumes, etc. And my role in the entire process, of course, beyond just coordinating uh, the day-to-day -day operational teams, um, is to look into marketing strategy for um, for the clients. So, for example, um, we recently helped um, deploy the Ethereum Istanbul update. Um, and by help deploy, I mean we looked into the marketing for it, or I looked into the marketing for it, um, and we developed sort of a scavenger hunt where people would go around try to try to find the um, the safety words and then get a wallet where you know they had I think it was five Ethereum um, in it, etc. So those are the sorts of things that I do on a day to day basis. Um, I'm also the author for a technology newsletter. Um, I'm not the the founder or the runner of it, but I manage a small team. Um, we sort of um, every week find uh, five to 10 news articles from various sources like MIT Tech Review, Financial Times, just sort of summarize them and do big picture analyses of them. And then in the past, I've had experience um, running an enterprise software startup as a product manager um, where we were developing in coordination with the second largest hospital chain in the Middle East, a blood donation um, facilitation platform, essentially. Um, we we ran that for, ran that for about two years. Had some great experience. Never actually um, got into the black. We never actually turned a profit. Um, but sort of chronologically backtracking, that would be where I first um, dabbled into entrepreneurship as a career path. Yeah, and then I'll, I'll go as well. Um, so I guess I'll start with the. Let's get that we're talking about some pretty um, legal facing things with blockchain. Um, in 2018, I had the opportunity to fly out to Seattle for the um, big data IEEE conference. Uh, and I presented a paper blockchain legal considerations, which was, or smart contracts legal considerations, which was um, focused on the implications of using self executing contracts in uh, legal settings. So uh, that was a really cool experience. Um, beyond that, uh, I am currently serving as the president of Miami University Blockchain Club. So we've got a ton going on. We were going to be hosting the Cincinnati Blockchain Implementations Conference in person uh, this upcoming April 10th. However, given all that's been going on, we are transitioning to a virtual conference and that's been coming together really well. Um, definitely a lot of interest from the people who had already signed up for CIC, but we're now able to access a much wider demographic given that we're going through virtual lanes rather than physical ones and the time contribution required of everyone is much less. So that's been really fun. Um, as well, uh, I co-founded uh, and serve currently as the chief technology officer for Blocks Consulting and our largest project we did out of that was TandaPay, which was a decentralized insurance platform. And we contracted that for about eight months, turned that around. Um, I specifically was focused on building the Ethereum code for that. Uh, so I did uh, basically a group contract that would take a bunch of people, um, crowdfund their money into this contract, wait 30 days, and then pay out insurance premiums. So I got um, some good experience with building um, escrow contracts there. Um, and I'm looking to employ that in this specifically. Um, let's see, did I miss anything else? Um, I guess uh, as well, um, I won the Blockland Cleveland 2018 hackathon. Um, I don't think they did a 2019 hackathon. Um, with a Hyperledger composer demo uh, of a document traceability network for um, foreign students who are like dealing with visas and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Uh, so, so you said it would be the first government to private collective funding platform? Yes. Yeah, because I was going to ask like some questions about competitors or, you know, why, 
what, what your advantages you have over them or why, um, you know, a, a big company couldn't just, uh, come in and do this. Mm -hmm. for you. Yeah. So, um, I think, I think, um, on the fundamental level, like I mentioned, there's, there's sort of two main avenues for, for companies to raise money. Um, the first being, um, very small scale kickstart operations, which really at a certain point leave our consideration bracket because, you know, they're trying to develop sustainable t-shirts. We're talking about companies that are trying to develop, you know, the next big solar pound technology. Right. Um, on the other hand, you know, we've got the financial institutions, um, which we are in contact with, um, who are involved in things like uh, stock issuance. Uh, like I mentioned, that dilutes the company. That's one of the big problems. Um, so there is definitely a case to be made um, for sort of this bringing emerging crowdfunding with um, government, public, private partnerships. Yeah, as it stands, that we're in a sort of a unique uh, window of opportunity um, that I think we're at an advantage on because we've already started capitalizing on it, uh, where the European Union and a lot of countries really in and around that area, like Turkey, um, are sort of exploring the use of fintechs to, um, to open up beyond, beyond um, the traditional um, proposal bids and the request for proposal. They're, they're looking to expand beyond that and establish new ways of raising funding. So there's a lot of uh, um, legislation, so to speak, going in our favor at the moment. And we think that our contacts within, you know, within the World Bank, within the governments, et cetera, are going to be pretty useful there. Um, as to your question of why a big company wouldn't be able to um, come in and imitate us, I think a big part of it is to do with that window of opportunity that I mentioned. Sure, they might be at an advantage over us when it comes to contacts within the government, um, but at the end of the day, with, when we talk about Microsoft, when we talk about Google, um, these are companies which A, usually have adversarial relationships with governments, um, and B, have a lot of organizational inertia going against the grain um, within uh, their own structures and within their own facilities. So they would be looking at a three to four year period to develop this project. And like I said, the adversariality that we saw come to fruition with Facebook versus the Senate uh, and the Libra project, I think is definitely something which puts us on a higher stepping stool than major companies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think like your domain, your domain expertise and aligning yourself like with a company like Mousebell, you know, we have a big university push and um, that has gotten us a lot of government contacts and things yeah. like that. Um, this is probably one of the most, probably one of the best pitches I've seen, um, with actual financials and, and, and a discussion around the tech. So really excited to talk about this with my team.